kids should know. Yeah. Yeah. So welcome everybody in this um, this meetup, this online meetup. Uh, yeah, that's that will not be this one. So this is a network yoga therapy meetup, and uh, today we are talking uh, about the neuroscience of meditation and um, um, and something is yeah something is uh, was going wrong a little bit there. And first, I would like to uh, to share a little bit about the why here. Um, why are uh, are we sharing this? Because network yoga therapy, we have the the idea to bring experts and professionals and, and everybody together who is, has a common interest in yoga or all the yoga practices, the science and also healthcare. And then under this um, uh, roof of network yoga therapy, we like to meet, see if we can find common grounds and share this also with others. So yeah, that's, uh, what, we're, um, that's we're, what we're trying to do here today with you. So, Welcome everybody in this case study yoga therapy. This is uh, Anneke Sips. I'm the founder of Network Yoga Therapy and I'm very happy that you're here with me and your Network Yoga Therapy. So um, this is where the minds meet the movement as we say that. And if you're interested in neurobiology and in meditation, then you're really at the right place today. So uh, meet us. So I was already uh, introducing myself a little bit. My name is Anneke, Anneke Sips. I'm a registered nurse from the Netherlands and I'm one of the first accredited yoga therapists here in, uh, in Europe and also in the Netherlands uh, by the a a a AIYT. This is the International Association of Yoga Therapists. So I think yoga and mental health, for, this is really what I'm most passionate about is the mental health aspects. I think it integrates really well. So, and here, this is Irina. Hi. And she's a scientist and studying the human brain and the cognition and a yoga teacher as well. And she considers yoga practices as an exciting scientific exploration. So, can you introduce yourself a little bit more? Yeah, so, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so, I studied biology and then I did a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. And uh, my own research is about... Uh, understanding objects, how do we make meaning of the world around us and how do we understand things and words. But I'm also very much interested in yoga and through already many years I've been looking into all this scientific research on what does yoga and different aspects of the yoga practice, what do they do to the brain. And I'm really happy to talk to Anneke today about this. Yeah, great. Well, I'm very happy that you're here. And um, well, there's a few, before we start, there's a few practical points that I would like to uh, notice. And um, one is switch off your phones. We, uh, we of course, switched off, uh, put it on the, on the airplane mode. So maybe this is something for you to do as well. Uh, maybe other web pages because we're meeting here online. And I know that other web pages and the, the computer can be very distracting. So just close it. and. Um, there is a, um, a Q and A. Maybe you see this somewhere on the bottom. You see this Q and A button, and please just ask all the questions that you can think of during this presentation and during this meetup, um, so that we can try to address them at the end. And if uh, if we cannot address them all at the end, then for sure we will try to address them all in the Facebook group, or we will make sure that we find other ways to do so. So, but it's good that we know what you uh, what your questions are. Um, so there's four. This is a series of four meetups. This is the first one. So three more to follow. Um, I will talk about this in a little bit more. Um, yeah, and this one is recorded. So this is why we were in the beginning. We were checking out if it was recording because that's very important. Then we can send it to your mailbox so maybe not everybody is here live because i know that more than 100 people signed up and this is very exciting i think so, good, yeah. <laughs> so cool from about 20 different countries and i know that in australia and in america then uh, people are maybe asleep 
So they will watch this later. And everybody will get this uh, in their emails. So yeah, well, that's, uh, I think that's a little bit about uh, what we're doing here today. This is a little bit about us. This is the work of network yoga therapy and uh, why we find this important to share. Um, the, the, the cool thing is, because I, I think we're, uh, we were just saying this as a joke a little bit, we are pretty cool nerds <laughs> sitting here. <laughs> but I think what the, the really the cool thing is, is that we're both from such a different perspective sitting here and we're talking about a case. And I think uh, this is very important as a yoga therapist um, or as any other therapist that you use your network and that you, uh, that you uh, uh, like consultate each other so that you connect with each other and that you like really meet maybe by phone or in person to talk about some cases because it's not only um well teaching you maybe new things but it also makes some connections in your own head it's really good to to look from a different perspective to the same uh, case this will open up maybe also uh, and it creates space for reflection within yourself and it offers maybe more tools that you can use in your work so in this situation right now we're talking here uh, from my perspective as a yoga therapist and her perspective as a neuroscientist, right? So you can, yeah, you can see this as the yoga therapist, neuroscientist are to, uh, talking together about the case, which is my case that I meet in my uh, situation. So what we do here live in front of the camera, we will do this again. So to give you also inspiration and ideas, but also maybe inspire you to do the same thing with your colleagues that you can find in your network. So this is the whole idea behind Network Yoga Therapy. We create this multidisciplinary network so that we can meet each other and learn and see things from different angles. So, because I think as a, as a yoga therapist in, in general, we're a generalist. Means that we know a little bit of everything. The yoga practice is a very holistic practice. And, um, and yeah, we, we, we don't have, and it's also maybe not possible to have expertise in all the different fields. So we're looking at things very generalistic and um, we're trying to, uh, well, to get support there from each other. Maybe you are a more specialized yoga therapist, that like me, I'm more specialized in healthcare, mental healthcare and psychosis and trauma. Maybe you do uh, have your own specialties as well, which is extra interesting, I think, to share this with each other. So the goals of this are like to, to meet each other, to see if we can find some common ground and to inspire you to do maybe a similar thing with your colleagues. But also maybe you can find things uh, in this uh, meetup that are uh, interesting for you to use in your own uh, cases, in your own work. Um, yeah, maybe also working with people, ADHD or concentration problem, something like that. So, Let's start. Let's see um, who we have here. Because I, I reckon, I would like to talk to you about a client of mine, and his name is Philip. Philip is a really nice dude. He's 34 years old. He lives in Amsterdam, and um, he was diagnosed when he was 17 years old, ADHD. He did not get treatment, and he kind of, uh, well, he, he's, he, he's working it out for himself. But uh, he does feel like he's struggling in some areas of his life. He has a girlfriend. He has a, a nice little house here, three high in, the, in the, his neighborhoods in uh, Amsterdam West. He's living. And uh, what, he, uh, what he's trying to do is starting his own meditation practice. But he found, like, he was reading a little bit. He was looking uh, online. Um, he was reading books about it. I think he did a workshop also once in the past. But for him, it's a little bit of a struggle. So this is why he contacted me. And he, uh, well, this is his uh, question to me. I would like to get uh, a little bit more uh, calm in my head because, uh, yeah, because I, I feel like sometimes uh, some simple things in his life, like, for example, the organization of his financial stuff are, the troubles, uh, are, are a struggle for him. Also, his work can be challenging. And, uh, well, he has a very clear question. I would like to meditate, but I can't. It's, it's very difficult. So I'm frustrated. Can you help me with this? Because the, I would like to learn. 
And uh, so, yeah, I was trying a few things. I was working with some asana, with different, um, <clears throat> different things. So what do I do as a yoga therapist? I look at the person. I, I look uh, at him holistically. So um, his body and his mind. Um, um, yeah, I was trying to, uh, to offer him some simple asana, some meditation practice. So we're trying out some things. And um, I would like to like, uh, oh, see how we can figure out some things on a brain level together, in this case of Philip, to help and support him even a little bit better. Right? So yeah, uh, thank you for these questions. And uh, so when we are talking about yoga, uh, we have this all different things that we do in yoga. It's meditation, movement, breath, sound, all these four different things we practice. So today, uh, Annika's question is about meditation. And uh, I will be talking about meditation as a cognitive scientist. So of course, meditation has a long tradition. It originates from uh, Buddhism. And um, I will be using some words, some concepts as a cognitive scientist, right? So this is a framework, this framework is a little bit different from what you would uh, see like in Buddhistic, Buddhism traditions. Uh, and uh, how I see meditation, uh, meditation is a mental training. And what I mean with the mental training, it's kind of a repeated behavior. And whenever we engage in a repeated behavior, we do the same thing over and over again. It changes the brain. It changes how the neurons are talking to each other. It changes how the brain areas are connected. And what's cool about it, like why, would, why, why is it interesting that the brain is changing? Because once the brain has changed, that also changes the behavior. So this is a loop. And this is a loop, this is something that we call learning. So anytime we repeat some behavior, we change the brain and then the brain drives us, controls our behavior and goes back over and over again. So when we want to change something in our behavior, for instance, we want to learn a new, something new, or we want to stop some behavior, like change a habit, or stop doing something that does not serve us, we have to start here with an intention. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see this very simple picture here, and of course intention also starts in the brain. So this is very much a simplification, but we have to start somewhere, and once, the intention is there, we can change the behavior. And the only way to change the brain is actually to change, to go over this cycle over and over again, to start behaving differently, and that would change your brain. And uh, that means that in your brain, there will be new personal traits or new skills mm -hmm. that would in turn affect your intention. And then the cycle goes over and over. So when we are talking about uh, meditation practice what i mean with intention here is just to be present in your life from moment to moment that's intention that's how i formulate the intention for the meditation practice and then from this intention we go to the practice this cycle of change between brain and behavior and that is what we call meditation just going there sit on your mat and stay there just try it. And once you go over the cycle over and over again, there are some changes in your brain, which includes new skills, so you train your attention, and new traits. And this, uh, the, your personality changes because the personality also originates in the brain. And these traits, uh, personal traits, we can describe as like mindful traits, the traits right? It's uh, non-reactivity, so being able to choose your actions, self-awareness, being able to monitor what's happening to you from moment to moment. And so this cycle goes over and over again. So can you give an example here? Uh, I think I'll go later on with okay. examples, cool. like on how actually med meditation works. Yeah. Right. So going back to uh, Philip. Uh, okay, so I now will 
talk about these components, like what do we do in meditation also from the cognitive neuroscience perspective. Mm -hmm. So we keep our attention focused, right? And this focus of the attention can be on something like breath, we can mm -hmm. count the breath, it can be bodily sensation, something that we do in a body scan exercise. Mm -hmm. It can be emotion or thought, like loving kindness meditation, when we're trying to focus on this feeling of connection with other people. Yeah, yeah. With the, with the, with Philip, I'm focusing very much on the breath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this case. That's a good yeah. entry point. In any case, from it's it's a very clear instruction. Mm -hmm. And uh, but at the at the end, it's the same attention mechanism. It's just that the focus of attention is diff is on the breath so in right? the brain in the brain it does a similar thing yeah exactly it doesn't yeah. matter what you choose as a focus of attention okay the, the mechanism in the brain is the same okay and another important component of meditation is acceptance so we sit try to focus our attention on on something like mm -hmm. our breath and whenever we notice that the attention drifts away or there is some distracting stimulus um, we accept it mm -hmm. we take a pose to choose how to react mm -hmm. right try to ac to notice the things without judgment and then pose and then shift our attention back to the object of meditation yeah so this is a cycle of meditation that's a practice that's a practice yeah. yes yeah it's so interesting because i think the this uh, figure that you were showing it's it uh, really has uh, has a lot of uh, com common with uh, some scaras right Really? Yeah, it, it does. It does. I'm I'm trying not to use any uh, Buddhism or Sanskrit terms because yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not my my field, not my speciality. But of course, know, but I'm, yeah. I'm the yoga therapist, yeah. and I'm thinking. But this is why it's so cool yeah. to the way you explain it. Like my in my head, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, ah, oh, this is this, this makes sense to me from a mm -hmm. yogic perspective. So mm -hmm. cool. So, okay, so then the, the, the components of meditation. So there is the, one component is attention and one is acceptance, right? Mm -hmm. Non-judgmental acceptance and attention to something. Could mm -hmm. be the breath, could be in the brain. Brain-wise, it doesn't matter. That's what you said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. brain-wise, it doesn't matter. Okay. So we just choose one focus of attention and then we practice this cycle of staying with it, noticing what's happening if the attention drifts away and mm -hmm. coming back. Yeah. So... What's more, most difficult for Philip? Like, yeah, struggle. That's uh, uh, what's most difficult for Philip is that he is, uh, yeah, he finds it hard to to continue. He finds it well. Um, he finds it hard to to keep sitting for a longer time because he's very easily distracted. And um, I, I notice this in many of my clients, but especially for Philip, it's even harder. Um, um, for him, it's uh, it's yeah. He, he's easily distracted, and he's he's off to do something else. So and he's forgetting. Like he's not okay. even like he wants to practice, but then he's it's just not happening. Like he mm -hmm. he's really missing that step of taking a pause and thinking of it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So these are the three symptoms of ADHD that we often see. It's the challenge with attention attention challenges impulsivity and hyperactivity mm -hmm. and that's like from a neurocognitive perspective if you think about it whenever we are doing something are uh, staying within some activity the brain does enormous background work that we don't even notice so for instance now i'm giving this this, this seminar this lecture for you and I have to keep track on my current task. I have to constantly remember from moment to moment what is this that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. If I just stand up now and go and pour myself tea, that would be weird, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that could happen with some people because they just don't, cannot remember from moment to moment what is the current task. Mm -hmm. Then my brain has to filter the sensory information. So, and the sensory information can come from the outside like, some cars, uh, noises, like sunlight from, from the window. This is all sensory information that can be distracted, dis um, that can yeah, distract my attention. But it can also come from the inside, like some internal signals, like my belly is growling, like my, my nose may itch. 
-hmm. And uh, in order to stay focused, I have to suppress all these non-relevant signals. So that goes automatically. That goes automatically. Very well. Yeah. Uh, like it, it, there, it's a background work. We don't notice it, but the brain just does it all the time. Every single moment you are engaged in a certain activity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also mm -hmm. has to suppress automatic responses because there are still some signals that the brain registers, of course. It can register that like my nose is itching and then I start scratching my nose. But that's not what I want to do now. I want to keep on going with my uh, talking. So, or for instance, like... Or you feel thirsty. Or I feel thirsty or I suddenly see myself and think about my hair. Like, so thoughts can also be distracting and then I, I get an impulse to try to fix it. So my brain has to suppress all these impulses. And the and behavior. Me, and the be comes that's from exactly, to suppress yeah. these automatic responses mm -hmm. to all these impulses. So, yeah, this isn't, if you think about it, it's very difficult work. <laughs> like, it's very complicated. And if any of these processes come, goes wrong or doesn't function properly or function or like altered a little bit, then we see ADHD symptoms like Philip has. And um, uh, yeah, so what happens in, in the brain of someone who starts meditating? And uh, you can see here, I hope, some brain figures. So the figure on the left is the brain, if we split it like, like this, if we split my head like this and open up it up, and look from the inside. And uh, on the left side is the front, on the right side is the back of the head. So this, in blue, you see the brain regions that change when people are engaged in some meditation training. I mean the little blue this, spots. Yeah, these blue spots with, with names of the brain regions. And uh, this uh, mm. figure is taken for, from a review article that means that this is an integration of multiple studies. And uh, these are the brain regions where statistically we see the most changes. So where we can also expect changes, where we take a group of uh, novices and uh, offer them a meditation practice. So these are the regions yeah, where we can expect some, some changes to happen. Mm -hmm. And what are the changes? It, it, this is... Um, changes that come with the more activity in these regions. So for instance, it can be increased uh, thickness of gray matter, it can be more uh, integration in the white matter, so in, in, the, um, uh, sub, uh, in the parts of the brain that transmit the signal from one region to the other. So that's, these are the changes that happen mm -hmm. in these regions. And for what is important for Philip is are these small uh, blobs in front. There's three uh, Like the um, prefrontal regions. Yeah. So prefrontal er areas of the brain are those that develop latest in the evolutionary perspective. So humans have this large prefrontal cortex compared to all, all other animals. And these are also areas that develop uh, last in the maturation. So they actually, it takes years and years for these areas to develop. Mm -hmm. And these are the areas that um, actually are involved in this cognitive control function. And this cognitive control, I mean keeping track of the current task, filtering sensor information, and, actually, and also the ability to notice our thoughts, like to be aware of what we're actually thinking. And that is it's called meta-awareness, right? So the brain is thinking, but the brain is also has this capacity to notice what is it thinking. But that's, that's really interesting, eh? yeah. because I think we are the only animal also that has the uh, possibility yeah. to it, being aware of the fact that we are aware. Well, it's uh, debated, I guess, now. Okay. If you talk to some people who study primates, they would say like that chimps also can do this, but that's debated. Oh, that's yeah. interesting, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but, but this, this ability to notice your own yeah. thoughts, this meta-awareness, exactly. how we call it, and to keep track of your current task and filtering this incoming sensory. Yes, exactly. Those so are the these three. are all the functions of the prefrontal cortex. Yeah. And those are the functions that develop in meditation. 
Mm. And there is this another region which is very important, which is called anterior cingulate cortex. And that, so this regions they function together in a network and that's this uh, when the anterior cingulate cortex comes to play uh, it becomes very important for inhibiting all the impulses and non-relevant responses so actually uh, yeah just keeping us from acting in, in, in a ways that are inappropriate for the situation for the current task mm -hmm. so that's also a very important region but what I want to say here that we we know that all these regions are involved in the attentional and control processes, but actually science is still very far from understanding what is the mechanism behind it. Okay. So we see the changes, we see that these regions are activated when people do these complex tasks, but we don't know the mechanism yet. Mm -hmm. And it also means that even though we do see how these regions develop in meditation, we also don't know what actually happens and what are the mechanisms. So, and that's, uh, yeah, that's just something to be aware of, right? That mm -hmm. science is still very, very far, well, I hope maybe not that far <laughs> from, from understanding the mechanisms. So, and what, yeah, just one little thing, but I yeah. find really cool that because meditation practices are so popular these days, there have been so many studies that, mm -hmm. Uh, address this question and this also pushes the science forward so okay. actually the popularity of meditation uh, and mindfulness practices helps scientists to understand how does the brain function and how how what is a consciousness what is a self right what is the attention? So, nice, huh? so yeah. it's not just we it's not like I'm seeking your help so that I can understand my client a little bit better no. on the brain level but it's also the other way around yeah I think it's really cool because you see that this type of research is now growing, and that's very much because the popular practices are popular. Yes. Ah, that's so cool. Yeah, it's so cool. So, if we now understand a little bit more about the brain regions and what parts of the brain are active in meditation, then how can this help me in uh, in understanding uh, the problem of Philip? Mm -hmm. And how can this help uh, Philip? Is there uh, an answer to that? So basically, if we go again through this cycle of meditation that we've already discussed, so what we do when we meditate? We sit there, we try to stay focused on the breath. That's a good entry point for Philip. And that mm -hmm. trains attention. When we notice a sensation or thought or an impulse, that's training of the self-awareness. So it's again the function of the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. And then instead of reacting, we take a pose, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you also teach in your meditation classes. Yeah. You take a pose and taking a pose, meaning inhibiting an automatic response. Yeah. So that's ex again, taps into the same co cortical network. Yes. And then you choose your action. So you may actually choose to scratch your nose if you have this impulse, yeah, that's yeah. okay. But you're not doing this automatically, right? you make this conscious choice. And that's again the function of the prefrontal cortex, it's a control of the action. And uh, of course, it can be very challenging for someone like Philip, who for, for if this, yeah, if, if these networks are uh, yeah, functioning not very efficiently, but it still can be trained. Okay. And going over and over again this cycle on your mat also helps to go over the cycle in real life, right? When next time, when he has to uh, act, choose to act differently, like in his relationships or in, in his work life, mm -hmm. he, can all, he can apply the skill that he has trained on the mat. And is it, will he then apply it like consciously or will his brain change so that it, unconsciously he's just applying this? At first, probably it requires a lot of effort, mm -hmm. like like <clears throat> even staying focused within the meditation practice requires some effort in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But with more practice, indeed, this becomes easier. Okay, but that, that's actually, I, I think then we're talking about the brain that changes, and maybe yes. this is a very nice subject uh, to talk about also in another 
meeting with you Indeed. because yeah. of this neuroplasticity and all that. I'm yeah. very, very interested in that. But it's not for now, but for next time, let's, uh, let's see if we can um, address that too because that's very interesting. So, but yeah, so in my practice with him, I can... Uh, I'm already like the, the pause. This is uh, like one of the, the main practices already to just pause. Mm -hmm. Also to remember to meditate. Yeah. And, um, and actually I'm also, uh, uh, I was teaching him to do it all the time on the same, well, every day on the same moment. So it becomes like a little ritual mm -hmm. and all this. I, I guess this is helpful in brain wise as well. Yes, of course it, uh, it helps to, first of all, to implement it, to bring it in the, in, in your life because once you've done it once in a certain situation it's easier to repeat it in the same situation mm -hmm. and once you've repeated it in the same situation enough n number of times you can also then generalize it to other situations mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 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 exactly so and uh, staying focused notice the sensation yeah these are these are the, the, the practices that we do so it's it's so beautiful so interesting that <laughs> is it really uh, uh, well, the, you can really relate it back to the to the brain. Yeah, I also find it really interesting. So if you look at back to this brain picture, then you saw the the the, the parts of the brain that lighting up in meditation. Um, is is these are the similar parts of the brain that light up in his issue? Yeah, very much similar. That probably that the dysfunction or function less in ADHD patients. But again, because there's no, uh, uh, yeah, so for some reason, some parts of the system can function uh, like below the, the, the appropriate level in ADHD. But because again, this uh, attention system is complex. It, it, it mm -hmm. uh, brings together multiple different processes like monitoring, control, inhibition, and all these things are functioning together. And we know that these regions are involved, but what exactly is happening and how they talk to each other, that's now being researched. There's okay. no mechanism known yet. So it's too simple to say, like, there is activity in meditation in this part of the brain. There is activity um, uh, in, in this part, similar part of the brain in Philip. So mm -hmm. meditation is a good option for him. Is that too yeah, simple? That's, that's too simple. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's yeah, too that's simple. That's, that's, it's good to keep in mind that it's too simple. Yeah, but, but yeah. sometimes like, it's, like, it's easy to think like this. Yes. Right? yes. So I think it's, it's good to, to mention this as well mm -hmm. because the, I see that um, many times in, in magazines or we see this kind of pictures of the mm -hmm. brain and, 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 and especially in, also in trauma and like this part lights up. So it means if you do this, then it's better. But yes. it's not that... It's not that simple because, um, yeah, we are measuring activity. But how this increase of activity transforms into the brain function, that's still not known. And that's what scientists are, are trying to solve really hard and maybe it gonna, it's going to change with in, in, in the coming years and it's it's maybe it could be a useful shortcut mm -hmm. right because yeah we know that uh something in ch is changing in the brain and the changes cover the same regions where the dysfunction in adhd comes from mm -hmm. so that's it's good to know this and it's a useful shortcut, but it's, and it's very, interesting. It's interesting, but so it's, it's important to remember yeah. that we don't know the mechanisms of attention really like we, we know a lot, but some important details are missing. Yeah. And the particular problems in ADHD, it's very com complex. And what exactly happens when we uh, meditate, that's also not really known yet at the mechanistic level yeah and that's important to remember yeah okay. yeah that's interesting um so so it really makes sense if 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 i stay with him in one practice or um yeah, so this, this ritual is very important for him. Mm -hmm. So he's motivated. So that is, that is uh, of course, very important. Without motivation, then, yeah. uh, then you don't, don't get anywhere. Then we, we, we choose a practice and we create a practice that fits him, something that he can do. So it's also very individual work. So we need to see what works for him. 
Um, um, so and then the, and then it's very important that he sticks to it, right? So there there are um, studying meditation practices is 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 it it's difficult, it's challenging because of course there are so many meditation practices, so many different practices, and so many people with different backgrounds who start to meditate. So when you try to formalize it and to measure the effects, you just come across uh, all kinds of problems with this. Like what's, mm -hmm. what, what's the amount of training that you need to introduce to people in order to get some changes? Mm -hmm. And what's the amount of, what is the amount of training after which you can measure the changes? And you can say that, okay, this practice really works or yeah. this practice doesn't work. Yeah. So mm -hmm. these are all challenges that uh, we as a scientific community had to face and uh, now it's actually, there are so many exciting studies, for instance, comparing different types of meditation. And this is a very recent project. It's still ongoing, actually, by, by German um, scientists. And you can see a link here if oh, yeah, you're interested. The, yeah. So what they did, they took a few hundreds of participants and uh, introduced them to meditation training with four different types of meditation over nine months. So people did blocks of meditation of different kinds. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's daily practice, so it's quite an intensive training. And they also measured the effects of each of the type of meditation after the... Oh, it's okay, somebody's asking okay. a question, no problem. <laughs> after, after the training, uh, after each module, and they also compared uh, the effects of the trainings. Mm -hmm. And what they actually find, that all these four different types of meditation act a little bit differently. So they, people report positive like mood effects and some kind of general positive effects from all of them. But for instance, a body scan meditation or breathing meditation develops more awareness to your bodily sensation, sensations. Or and the uh, loving kindness type of meditation develops more emotional awareness and, and the ability to connect to other people. And that actually, these differences are measurable. So the seen in the brain. And, and also seen in the brain, wow. in terms of which regions are changing. Yeah. Which means that you have to be aware of the practice that you're doing and what, what's actually you're doing now and what, what you want to develop, yeah. where you want to be. And uh, yeah, I would say it's more effective to stick with one practice mm -hmm. and yeah, and try more, so do the same thing over and over again. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So interesting. So do we want to look at the questions now? Um, no, it's okay. We can uh, yeah. look at it later. Yeah. yeah. Um, so and how long does he has to meditate to see changes? Is there? Uh, is there? Something, can you say something about that? So, I can say that all the research studies on the topic use quite intensive trainings. So, especially those studies that involve brain scanning, because of course, like we want, we want to see changes in the brain, and we know that it takes time to change the, to to actually these changes to occur. Yeah. So, it's often. What, what's the intervention that is often used is the eight weeks of mindfulness meditation training. Mm -hmm. It's a mindfulness-based stress reduction course. Mm -hmm. And that involves eight weeks, so it's two months of daily practice. Um, and that has to be like up about one, uh, around one hour of meditation, guided meditation daily. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, it's quite intense. Mm -hmm. If you've ever tried to do this, it's, it's difficult to integrate this one hour of meditation every day in your life. Especially if you didn't have any practices. Yes, before. especially if you didn't have any practice and you have your work, you have your family, you have all the other obligations. Yeah. That's, that's quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, so this is the intervention that is very often used. And because there have been so many studies looking specifically in this intervention and evaluating the effects of this specific intervention. We can also summarize uh, what are the effects of this intervention. And what you see here is um, a chart 
um, summarizing these effects on how this intervention reduces certain clinical symptoms, yeah. like anxiety, pain, and depression. That's the green line. Yeah, right? that's the green yeah, line. And the green. scale here, if you look at this, uh, it, it's called average effect size. So what the effect size tell the, tells us is how much difference we can expect, uh, how much effect we can expect from the intervention, Mm -hmm. in terms of a, the difference from the control group. Mm -hmm. So if we take 100 people and let them go through this training, and then take 100 people and let them go through a control condition, which has to be active condition, has to be some sort of meetups, some sort of daily activities, mm -hmm. it has to involve some sort of daily activities, but not necessarily involving mindfulness meditation. Uh, so this effect size, so if you see this uh, scale says 0.3 here. That's the last red line. Huh? Uh, no, so actually the scale is for all the uh, bars. Yeah, but under, right? under the yeah. last, uh, yeah, yeah that's the scale is under the, yeah. Yeah. So these numbers. effect yeah. of 0.3 means actually that we, it's actually really not very big, right? It's, it's moderate, which means that we only expect so there are complicated statistical calculations involved but to put it simple we only expect around 10 people to improve in in our uh to show better outcome in the actual group 10 out from of 10 out of 100 okay yeah then in the control group mm -hmm. so because what what often happens in this kind of studies is that the control group also shows some changes mm -hmm. and but and this effect sizes here, yeah, they mean that it's only like a small part of these people who actually improve more than uh, in the control condition, which is still um, interesting, right? Because it does mean that the, these interventions work. Mm -hmm. But it also means that there is a lot of variability. And if you're a yoga teacher, of course you know that people are different. They come with different backgrounds. They come with different baseline conditions. They come with different intention in your, in the practice, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to compare how much the practice affects them in, at, at the group level. Yeah, right. Yeah, you don't very often. Yeah. so you don't know. Like, and for some people yeah. it might work, for others it doesn't. Yeah, and that's what the bars tell us. So, what I think is important to to keep in mind here that we do see that mindfulness meditation in this case works and it helps to decrease all these clinical symptoms, but the effects are moderate. And yes. it's also comparable to the effects of other types of therapies like DBT or uh, progressive relaxation intervention. All these things also work at, at the comparable level of course. Yes, they are also related to mindfulness ideas. And mm. It's beautiful. Still, it is good to keep in mind because we often think of yoga and meditation as this one remedy all purpose mir miraculous thing and it's good to stay a little bit critical yeah, <laughs> just yeah. keep in mind that the known statistical effects of these interventions are not that big yeah it's not all yeah unicorns rainbows and magic yes yeah and it also and this is <clears throat> eight weeks of intensive practice which means we don't have data on like mindfulness apps you know if you do something for like one minute a day mm -hmm. we don't know if it works or not yeah probably it is a good entry point but in order to have some measurable effect you have to choose a practice and commit to it mm -hmm. and practice every day so there are also studies on some shorter interventions like mindfulness based intervention that only takes one week mm -hmm. but it is a one week of daily guided meditation plus three times uh, individual sessions it is also quite intensive if you think about it mm -hmm. and yeah from that one week you also see some measurable effects on like decreasing uh, anxiety and depression symptoms yeah yeah and then if i go back to philip because we uh, this was his question uh, to study meditation and uh, to use this as a tool and I see, like maybe on neurobiological <clears throat> uh, level, um, it, it does something, but it's not like a miracle, of mm -hmm. course, but it does something. And um, 
but I think also what like there's many other aspects that are very uh, very helpful from my perspective from a yoga therapist is that the connection with me and that he feels like uh, that like he's here and mm -hmm. and and it's for him uh, we are creating uh, in this practice like little success stories which mm -hmm. is very empowering for him yeah and that's very beautiful I think to uh, to see him um, developing on these success stories because he was. Uh, telling me that very often things went wrong in his life and he mm -hmm. felt a little bit like a failure and um, And then he started to practice by himself and he wanted to sit for one hour every day And he still felt a little bit like a failure mm -hmm. and it's really beautiful that how we now work together And I make it little chops and he feels now like he's a success story every time So I'm so, um, just very curious how this would work in the in the brain levels of course. Yeah I mean it, it could be like of course, in this group practices, there are so many components. Like there is a, your personal relationship with the teacher. Mm -hmm. There is this community component when you just when you are involved in a group and you meet regularly. Mm -hmm. That also it can be very helpful. Just it doesn't matter what exactly you do together. Mm -hmm. Like all these things help. And from the scientific perspective, we want to know if this is about meditation or if it's about all the social community components. Mm -hmm. And yeah, from the perspective of a practitioner, maybe you're not, it doesn't matter that much. Yeah. I mean, if it's anagha, if it helps you, it's okay. Yeah, as yeah. Long as if it, it helps. helps. It yeah, helps. yeah, and it helps and you feel yeah. good. That's, uh, yeah. But it's, 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 I think it's, it's very important to stay critical yes. and to really, uh, really, really, yeah, keep, keep thinking like this. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree. Wow. Yeah. Very, very cool. Um, let me see. We also need to uh, check out the time a little bit. Where um, can we go to the next one? Let's see what's uh, what's happening. So there. we are already done. Yeah. So this, these are the take homes actually, right? Yeah. So um, to to have a little overview, there was Philip wants the meditation practice. So we were practicing on this. I would like to understand a little bit more on the brain level what helps. So there's mm -hmm. parts of the brain involved in meditation, similar to the parts in the brain, similar parts that are activated um, in, in, in his situation. That do not work properly in, in his, with his diagnosis. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, but we cannot just say one and one is two. Yeah, yeah. But it's very interesting that there's happening something. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of research done. It's also what I found very interesting in your story is that, uh, is that the research is not only helping the yoga therapists, but we are also helping yeah. the research because because of the popularity of yoga, the, the the scientists are very happy to to have get more. Yeah, and I think because this kind of has brought all the uh, the Buddhism tradition has a very com complex and very developed framework of cognition, mm -hmm. and because all this, this meditation practices are so popular and because it's now being applied in the neuroscience, we kind of have to look at the, at the cognition from the Buddhist tradition and it helps. I mean, it, it kind of gives some interesting insights and yeah, I think it's, especially to all these questions, like neurophilosophical questions, like what yeah. is consciousness? Like what, what is a self? Yeah. Who is the well, observer what? there? Like how super cool yeah. is that and we all like this i think it's where we find the common ground because we all studying this mm -hmm. like as a scientist and as a yoga therapist and then we're both uh trying to find the answer and it's yeah. uh, maybe it's a lifelong study right yeah. and but it's it's really um it's really nice to to see that science is getting more interested in in these practices and of course the the yogic uh practices and it goes all the way back all these thousands of years and the buddhist practices there's many levels and it goes very deep now in this context here i was asking you like a simple question and we are doing this meetup which is only like a short amount mm -hmm. of time we didn't go through all these levels of course but uh, like it's not also not that simple like meditation is not only like um, yeah I think it's it's good to, to mention that that of course there is many more levels and there's a lot to discover and to yeah. and this discuss also that's 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 a very good idea I think if yeah if you, if you get together and make little groups of, of, of well within your network with scientists and Buddhists and yogis and, and talk about what is self and what mm -hmm. is 
the, the, the all this development there, right? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So what we want to take home is in yoga there is no quick fix. So it will it will take time, right? So it's yeah. uh, you need to practice, practice. You need to find your uh, your uh, your practice that fits you, your rituals, and incorporate this in your life. So, so commitment is important. Commitment is important. So having a good relationship with your teacher can help maybe mm -hmm. with other people to, to practice together or something like this. Some find a way that, so for me and for other yoga therapists, find a way that, that, that helps the motivation and commitment of your client because you want your client to practice, practice, practice like for yeah. a longer time. There is no quick fix. So there is the another take uh, take home <laughs> message is choose a practice and yeah stick with it it's yeah. a little bit uh, similar as uh, as the as the other one and i think the breath just breath awareness it's a good starting point mm -hmm. for for people who just start yeah it's it's very yeah the breath and body awareness but that you know of course is yeah. the therapist yeah great great so choose one, stick with it. <laughs> Try not to go shop too much, as we yeah. also saw that there's different levels are activated and different mm -hmm. intentions are set with different types of practices, yeah. right? And the last one, very important, this is more for the, for the therapist, right? Yeah, for the therapist, I think it, it's important to uh, look out for what research is, is there, like, but also stay a little bit critical, like on, on these big claims, because, mm -hmm. of course, mindfulness and, and yoga and uh, meditation, it is a hype. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's very, it, it's possible just to lose the essence in the hype. And you just start repeating, repeating, repeating when, what other people say. And, yeah, at some point, it just becomes too far away from the reality, from the facts. So it's, it's right. good to stay critical. <laughs> Stay critical, people. <laughs> yeah, but for real, like it's it's very important to not just say what other people say. And this is also what I really like. This is from your perspective. You say <laughs> stay critical differently than I yeah. say. But in, when I te when I'm uh, learning about yoga for my teachers, for example, Eiji Mohan, he uh, he always uh, like wants me to ask questions, mm -hmm. and he. He says, which is one of his things that he always uh, talks about, he says, doubt is the teacher. Yeah, I love that's it. like how science works, right? Doubt. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> the, the, the yoga hippie and the, the scientific uh, hippie yeah. <laughs> thinking similar. No, but it's, it's, really, it's yeah. really true, I think. But, but it's, it's I mean, good to be aware of that. If we would just believe in everything, there would be no science, right? Because the science works by kind of ruining what what people have said before and, and mm -hmm. kind of going further and yeah yes yeah, for curious people right yeah yeah so well stay critical very important and uh, what's next because we are going a little bit to the end of this uh, meetup and um uh, i think there are questions but um i will um i'll come to that later but first i want to uh, talk to you a little bit about what's next because there is a next and there's more case study going on. I hope you liked it and uh, give us your feedback as well so that we can yeah. learn and develop these things uh, ourselves. But we have three more cases that we would like to discuss on a neurobiological yoga therapeutic level. And this is Tom. Tom uh, with Tom, we look into depression and the role of movement from the brain level. And, and body. And body. Yes. Yeah, of course. Well, the, the brain is in the body. And it's not moving, yes. It's a yeah, body. <laughs> the body is moving, we do with the body as well. But, um, but a neuro, neurobiological yes. uh, perspective. So depression and yeah, we, we were trying to, I was trying to find cases that, um, that maybe other people can relate to as well. Mm -hmm. So depression, I hear a lot of people are, uh, have questions about depression. And I think the role of movement is very important important and interesting there so i'm very curious about this one can't wait and then there's simone simone uh, with simone we uh, want to look into anxiety and the role of the breath mm -hmm. because i think that's a very interesting one because we were just uh, saying well the breath is a very nice first practice well what if you're very uh, if you're very fearful and you yeah. you suffer from anxiety and the breath is only make it worse if you think of the breath so mm -hmm. stuff like that happens um 
we'll go into that one in another one. And then we look into trauma and the role of sound. I love yeah. it. So cannot wait to, to talk about Elizabeth as well. Then um, also network yoga therapy, we're offering uh, much more than only these uh, online meetups. We are also offering yoga training for mental health. And um, there's a really beautiful training retreat coming up in Portugal. Maybe you've heard about it already. There is an, a membership uh, so we can, uh, we, we can meet each other for online mentoring and integration support. There are master classes like uh, little mini courses, things like this. This is 100% online. And there's this Swasta Yoga and Ayurveda by H. Mohan and Indra Mohan and their children, uh, Ganesh Mohan, Dr. Ganesh Mohan and Nitya Mohan. And with all this whole family, I'm organizing with Network Yoga Therapy events in the Netherlands. So this is the yoga therapy training. There is yoga for sound with Nitya. There's um, the, the, the parents, A.G. Mohan and Indra themselves. They will come also this summer to the Netherlands. So hope to see you there. And then this training retreat in Portugal is a very interesting one. This happens from the 22nd to the 29th of April. And um, there's a very cool thing going on now on if you book on Facebook, before thing then you can bring your friend for free because we think that we really need our friends and we do this stuff together so bring your friends and your colleagues and you can get in for free uh, this the second person of course you need to pay for the retreat center and food <clears throat> so your bed and the food but the training itself is for free so you can check the website www.nytacademy.com and then you go to trainings and you see all the information everything that I'm talking about here so yeah <clears throat> time is up there are questions um, and I, you know, I've got a really good idea. Let's make it into a little live video. We will answering the questions in a little live video just right now and we'll put it on the Facebook group. So Network Yoga Therapy Facebook uh, page and group, we will uh, put a little video where we answer the questions. So we can round this one up. So I thank you, uh, thank you so much for, um, for, for being here and for, uh, for explaining all this. And we will, uh, yeah, we will, we will look into the questions right after we uh, we close this screen, and um, so move to the Facebook group Network Yoga Therapy or the page, and we will share the answers to the questions over there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.